be in the company of a man who's been at the very top of the show business tree for more than 50 years as a singer, a comedian, an actor, a presenter, and most of all as someone who is extremely dear to us on Songs of Praise. Now, if I have to come up with just one clue to his identity, I suppose it has to be this. can you say about a man who was in at the very birth of television at Alexandra Palace, the first night of ITV and the Sydney Opera House, whose magnificent voice took him right to the top of the pop charts. He starred in no less than 11 Royal Variety performances, several feature films, remember Oliver, and he was unforgettable in the stage production of Pickwick. And more than that, 50 years ago, he created Neddy Seagoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Harry Seacombe. Not in a hurry, are you? Another opening, another show In Philly, Boston, or Baltimore I caught you at the door! A chance for stage folks to say hello Good evening. Hello, folks. Hello. Show. This is my very first song to praise. I'm a grassroots Christian. I mean, uh, I know that my Redeemer liveth is what means, that's what it means to me. And I think if you, don't, if you haven't got faith in something, you'll never get better. And if you don't, well, they are. you put yourselves in the hands of God. I hope we've got safe hands. <laughs> we have to be. Be a good wicked keeper, wouldn't he? God. <laughs> Great to see you, Harry. And of course, at the end of that piece, there yeah. we saw an excerpt from the Everyman program, "The Trouble with oh, Harry," that's right, yes, which yes. really sort of charted your progress after your stroke, which was what nearly two years ago. The end of January last year. Mm. That's about eighteen months, isn't it? Yeah. I've got uh, uh, prostate cancer, diabetes, and a stroke. <laughs> and the one thing to do um, to forget about prostate cancer is to have a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> it concentrates the mind, John. <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> But, I mean, there are things that are never going to be quite the same again. No, well, I think you, once you get a stroke, you say, well, that's it. Uh, you know, for now, that's the end of the uh, Harry Seagull that was, and now there's a new life opening up. So it's Do you great. find yourself grieving in some ways for what you've lost? Not really. I think if you wallow in self-pity, then you're, you, know, it's, it's, you don't get anywhere. You've got to accept what's happened to you and, and get on with life. And little triumphs you look forward to, you know, perhaps... Uh, I couldn't, I, you, you called this hand Dead Fred for a long time. <laughs> Come along, Fred, I can see you moving about now. <laughs> Not much, but I can move it about. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking of hands... Of you can make it take your nose off, pardon? <laughs> you were talking about God's hands and that yeah. you felt very aware of being cupped in God's hands. Now, how? How did you know well, that? I, well, I felt... Many years, well, some years ago, back in 1988, 1980, I had a very uh, serious operation in Barbados. I had an operation for a, a burst colon. And uh, suddenly I, I came down to earth on the back. You realize you're mortal, you know. And I, I realized then I had to think things more easily, had to think, reassess my position, you know. Think about uh, how good God has been to me. Because I believe that. Uh, he has been very good to me. I've been good to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I think, no, it's very important that, that you believe that uh, uh, he's behind you and everything. And I'm nearly 80 now, so when my time comes to go, I'll be there. 
Well, one of the, the saddest effects, of course, of that stroke was that your lovely voice will probably never again be quite what it was. Yeah, before. well, I realised then that uh, the old voice had gone. I mean, I worked hard on it. I studied for 12 years with an old maestro called Mandu di Baroli, who sort of took my voice apart like a mechanic. <laughs> and he used to say to me, Harry, please don't go cross-eyed in the middle of this aria. <laughs> but I'd, I'd mess about with the song before I started. And then once I got into the music, I'd really, really go for it. But uh, I find music exhilarating. I used to love the recording sessions we did uh, on Highway and Songs of Praise. That was the best time for me. We're going to hear now from someone who I suppose could be described as a bit of a rival, but she's a, a pretty affectionate one. Ah. Hello, Harry. Ah. There's nobody in the world I'd rather talk about than you. And don't be getting flattered. Do you remember when we were at the Palladium all those weeks? We really had a lot of laughs for the little we know each other. Well, I did Songs of Praise for 17 years, and you did Highway for what? Was it more than that? Because there's quite a lot of fun in it, if you like me or like you, which I'm sure God intends. I, I think when you talk about the Lord, he doesn't want you to be long-faced. There's so many wonderful things to talk about. But I do hope that you're feeling much better. Well, as a matter of fact, I needn't have said that because I've inquired very much about you. And you'll be back again. If you do another Palladium season, will you give me a small part? I just want to come on Sweeping the stage, <laughs> sweeping your feet from under you. God bless you. Well, he will, because you're a good man, Harry. And it's a pleasure and a pride in me to know you. God bless you. She's talking there about how God doesn't want long faces. And, of course, when you were first asked to do Highway, you were mostly known as a comedian I, I, with a good line in raspberries, Yeah, I wasn't you? quite sure whether I was the right bloke for the job with all the raspberry blowing and uh, boon show connotation. <laughs> I thought, so I thought, well, let, let's try six and see where it goes. The uh, first one we did was at, uh, in Durham. And it was a member Sunday programme. And I got so involved that I, I thought, was this for me? And I, I really... Uh, but, because when you go to a town normally... Um, in the, the theatre, you go to the theatre, 
you don't really mix with the people of the town. You don't meet anybody. You just go to the theatre, read your mail, go to the picture in the afternoon, have a kip, and come on do the show and go home. But when you go on Songs of Praise or Highway, you met the people, who, you know, the people who are doing good in the town and all the... Uh, you, you became involved in the, in the sort of... Uh, the people themselves, yeah. and I like that. Well, of course, you, you've done Songs of Praise for six years, but how many years did you do Highway for? Ten years. Not bad for a six-week run, a medal. was it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just looking back to Highway, some of the people that you met in the early days went on to great things. I mean, do you remember Evelyn Glenny? She was in the well, Highway was great, Orchestra, yes. wasn't she? Well, the first time we met her was at Balmodel, and she, uh, she, they told me she was profoundly deaf, and I didn't really believe it. She lip-read so well. But I called her Evelyn for the evening, and she put me right. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's still putting you right. Take a look at this. So, hi. Hello. <laughs> and welcome to my Aladdin's Cave. You know, we shared some wonderful times together when you really kept an eye on my early career. Through the many programs of Highway, of course, and Songs of Praise, it's people and friends like you who have given me a tremendous amount of faith to carry on as a solo percussionist and to believe in my own aims and goals. We had some wonderful moments, and of course, there are still many moments that we still have to fulfill in both our lives. You always seem to show, and do seem to show, a great exuberance in all you do. And nevertheless, the underlying spirituality of, of all you do and the commitment um, is really quite extraordinary. I really, truly wish you a wonderful evening. Just have a great, great time. <laughs> Lovely to hear from Lovely you. Lovely to You have often spoken of Songs of Praise holding a very special place in your heart. Why? Why is that so special? Well, I like Songs of Praise. It, it's the lusty singing of the congregation. I think they follow along and see everybody singing. And, and it's great to hear people singing from the heart. Not professional singers, but really singing from the heart. Well, they don't come much more great or classic than the Welsh hymn. We're going to sing for you now. Our conductor is Neltra Dinnick and the hymn, Come Rhonda, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Great. When you meet so many people as you have done over the years and talk to them about their faith, does that make an impression on your own? Does it make you wonder about your it own? It does. I think um, seeing these people and, and knowing what they've done, because we had ordinary people who had done extraordinary things on the show, 
you realize that their faith must be very, very strong. So you, you, you think to yourself, well, there's something in it. You know, I've always been a Christian, but I've never really had that depth of faith that some people have. Mm. But I've learned since I'm illness that I have, and that I've, I've learned more to lean on God. The, the very first highway you did was for remembrance. Yeah. And over the years on Songs yeah. of Praise, of course, you've been very closely associated with that. But it has real meaning for you, of course, remembrance. Can I remind you of one man that you met through remembrance on Songs of Praise, Billy Griffiths? Do you recall oh, his Billy story? Griffiths was marvellous. He was in Burma, and uh, and he stepped on the money, picked up the money, blew his hands off and blinded him. But he's a marvellous example to anybody who's in adversity. And he, he rejoices in every day. He's a wonderful man he is. Well, you obviously remember a great deal about him. I do. And he will never forget you. Oh. Well, Harry, after you came to Blackpool to interview me, you stayed for a while afterwards, and uh, I soon knew that you were a loving family man and that you had faith in the good Lord and you were certainly interested and helpful towards we disabled people. And this was very evident when you came to join our St Dunstan's group of war blind on the Horse Guards Parade in London on Remembrance Day. Uh, we were very proud and honoured that you were in our little group, being a famous singer and comedian. And of course, you were an ex-service man. You served in the Middle East during the war. Actually, that's how, how I always picture you now, in soldier's uniform. <laughs> And I'm sure that when we arrived at the Senate South for our two minutes silence, that your thoughts were on those lads out there in the wartime who'd suffer. And uh, although it was raining the whole time on parade, uh, it didn't dampen our spirits. And as we moved off from the Senate South and a band struck up, I thought that at, at any moment you'd touch a spring in your step. At any moment, I thought we were going to burst out into some Welsh patriotic song. And it really, really was the end of a, a truly memorable occasion in so many ways. And it was nice a couple of days later when we had a, a beautiful arrangement of flowers signed by Harry and Myra. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, very brave man, very brave man. And he's sitting right there, look, in the front row. He's come along well. <laughs> to wish you well. Oh. <laughs> Now, there's a man who's been to hell and back because of war. Oh, You've yeah. been in the front line uh, yes. in, in war. Uh, how do you hang on to a belief in a loving God when you're surrounded by the violence, the inhumanity of war? Well, I used to pray a lot. I think in the Strip Trench, everybody is a Christian, believe me. And. Uh, I, was, I found out after some time that the Germans were holding drumhead services. And I thought, oh dear. So I prefaced my prayers by saying, this is Lance Pomeroy, Seacom 904378, <laughs> so they know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he, he did answer my prayers, I must say. Well, I'm glad he did. And um, actually, we're going to hear almost a prayer set to music that you sang during one of our Songs of Praise Remembrance programs. Here is Harry singing, God Be In My Head. God in my head, and in my understanding, God in my eyes, and in my looking, God in my mouth, and in my speech. 
course, during the war, for a lad who really had not strayed very far from Swansea before, suddenly you got sent overseas. Where, where did you go? Where North Africa. We went there in November 1942, and uh, we had a quite, a, quite a tough time. 132 Field Regiment, Swansea Terrier, Swansea Territorial Regiment, and uh, we had a lot, lot of, uh, lot of, lost a lot of lads out there. Mm -hmm. And we got to, to Borba was our worst place. We just got within a few miles of Tunis. We were trying to take Tunis very quickly, but we ran out of uh, ammunition and things. We started throwing stones, they didn't like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's typical of you, isn't it, that you're talking about very, very dangerous, very fearful times, and you're cracking jokes. And I imagine that's probably how you got through it at the time. I used to lead retreats. <laughs> Cracking jokes as you went. <laughs> but do you ever get over the fear, Harry, of waking up in the morning and not being sure if you're going to live through that day? I never get over it. I don't think anybody does. I mean, you can't, you can't share your experience with anybody else. You can't tell people what war is like. You can't tell them about what it is to see a pal dying or, or that sort of thing. You can't share that. But those people who have been with it, been through it with you, understand. Even if you don't say anything, they understand. You hold hands now and again and shake hands. And shared memories. Well, we're going to hear now from someone who understands exactly what you're saying, someone that you knew in the war. You might have mixed feelings, of course, when you see this particular chap, but um, he is, in fact, 92 years old, and he's still the headmaster of Hill House School in London. Now, Lance Bombardier Seacombe, come here. <laughs> my servant, Prothero, tells me that you've been mimicking my voice. Do you remember that, Harry? That was way back in 1941. Um, I had my, I was a battery commander, 321 battery, and we had our guns dug in on Ditchling Beacon, defending the coast of Brighton. And our headquarters we set up in a goat farm, and you were the battery clerk. And there you, with one finger, you would type out battery orders and answer the telephone and arranged to pay the men. Both of us came out of the war still alive, and so many of our friends and comrades didn't. And that, after the war, changes one's view of life altogether. And you have led a very good life. And I understand, Harry, that you still mimic me. <laughs> so you're as bad as you ever were. <laughs> Well, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Townend, of course, can you still mimic him? Brother, brother! <laughs> well, we're going to hear now from another couple of your old wartime mates. Yes. In fact, your friendship with them goes back even further because they were Swansea lads, oh. just like you. Hello, Harry. Lovely to see you again. Uh, we go back a very long time, you'll remember. We used to bump into one another on the way to school. When we joined the Territorial Army together, you did much to raise our spirits. Uh, we were at the lowest there because we had left our loved ones and acquaintances at home and were all gathered together in a strange place. I used to find you, Harry, always joyful, always cracking jokes, always uh, um, concerned for people who were in need. It was no surprise to me that you um, finished up um, presenting songs of praise because all through our acquaintanceship your uh, faith was obvious to anyone who knew you. My prayer now, Harry, is that the good Lord will bless you with better health in the future. And I ask this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Lovely. Bill Barrington. Bill Lord Barrington, Evans. Aubrey Evans. Yeah. yeah. Two good men. Yeah. Well, of course, after the war, you were issued with your regulation D-mob suit and a one-way ticket, of course, back to Swansea, back That's to it. your hometown. And once you were back on home territory, do you remember this chap? Yes, the vicar. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Reverend Jenkins, I think. Jenkins it preferred... Davis, it was, yes. Yes, that's right. Ooh. Well, you were a choir boy, of course. I, I, I went to church every Sunday, every service. I love the hymns. I was, to lead, I was very short, not very tall now. <laughs> I used to lead, lead the boys out to the choir stalls, always looking angelic. <laughs> I used to have a, a cast of pocket full of sweets. 
I always used to find the ray of sunlight coming through the stained glass windows and sort of do that to it. <laughs> until the choir master said, stop doing that, Sigo. I don't want to. It was good of my grandmother's on, on a Sunday night after church. And I'd go out to there and outside loo. And I'd sit there with the door open and I'd sing hymns. They thought I was mad. <laughs> Well, we took David Wigram, who until recently was the Radio 2 Young Chorister, oh, yes. back to that church, back to St Thomas's St. Thomas in Church. Swansea, yeah, to sing There Is a Green Hill Far Away. There is a green hill far away without a city wall where the dear crucified who died to save us all we may not know we cannot tell what pains he had to Lovely, lovely. Brought back memories of that church. Other memories, I'm afraid. And of that Green Hill. Green Hill, yes. It, it actually was a district of Swansea, Green Hill. You certainly didn't stay in Swansea for long because you started treading the boards. You did That's all right, sorts yeah. of variety shows. The Goons came along, 1951 yeah. to 1960. Do you know, even now, what it was about that series that made it such a cult? We had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, just four young lads. We weren't afraid of anything in those days. You know, we were come out of the army, fought for our lives, and uh, it was just joy. And um, I don't know what, because it was different, I think. We carried a, a joke to its illogical conclusion, that was the thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, after that, of course, your name was up in lights, really, wasn't it? And we're about to hear from a singer. She's got very fond memories of singing along with you, and, um, in fact, I believe you taught her all that she knows. Take a look. It's always a pleasure to present a new and exciting talent on my show, and tonight we have a young soprano from the Covent Garden Opera Company, for whom I predict a great future. Well, hello, Harry. Good ah. evening. And what a wonderful evening for you, and I have the pleasure of joining you. We've done a lot of things together, but in particular we sang We're a Couple of Swells. Can you remember that? We're a couple of swells. We stop at the best hotel. But we prefer the country far away from the city. You had this beautiful natural voice and it was just such a joy to hear it. You've had your ups and downs. I mean, you've gone to some pretty low lows with your illnesses. But, you know, God's been there for you, obviously, and your incredible faith in him has brought you through. Your strength I admire. I hope you have a wonderful evening. And it's such a pleasure, really a pleasure, to be involved. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, she lovely. talks about pleasure, but, of course, actually, the word that comes to mind when you sing is fun, isn't it? It Harry? is fun. Show business is a, a, a notoriously fickle uh, world, It really, can be, it? yes, it mm. can be. But you have managed to not just make, but to, to keep some very close friendships over the years. Well, I've been very lucky with my friendships. I've, I've made friends uh, and I've kept them. I, don't, you know. I think it's more than luck, Harry, and I think we're about to hear that now yeah. from a couple of old friends of yours. You've got some very fond memories of Harry. Hello, Harry. <laughs> um, you know this story because I've said it so many times to you, and I think it sums up you as a person. Uh, we were both on the bill at Cleethorpes, you were the top of the bill, and well, you had to really look for my name, so I was right at the bottom. 
and I was dressing with Duncan's Collies. <laughs> Six dogs, a dog act, all Collies, and me. Um, so I thought, I can't do this. I went down there and tried, but they were all over the place. You, you couldn't take your trousers off. It was, it was absolutely awful. Well, there I was, putting my tap shoes on at the stage door. He said, well, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, you can't do that. He said, uh, come into my room. I said, but you're the, you're the top of the bill, Harry. I'm the, he said, never top of the bill. He said, come into my room. And he took me in. Which corner would you like? And he gave me a corner all of my own. And, and ever since then, and when I became a top of the bill, many years later, I tried to be like Harry. Harry the person. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, I've not rehearsed what? Well, I'd known you a long time Don't then, worry. Harry. And you've been a worry. good lad and a wonderful friend all those years. And I always think of the wonderful laughs you've given me over the years. That wonderful telegram you sent from Bolton to Michael Pentine, which said, audience with me all the way, managed to shake them off at the station. <laughs> Then that other time we went to the war office, actual war office in London, they were all looking out the window, the clerks and secretaries, and you jumped out the car and said, hello lads, where's the war? <laughs> Bye Harry, have a wonderful time. Ah. Uh. Lovely. Norman Vaughan. In fact, you were flatmates, weren't you? At one we point? weren't, yes. Mm -hmm. We shared a flat in Notting Hill Gate. He was in the army with me, on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> it's very handy in a flatmate. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to me that loyalty and, and care, not just for your friends, but from friends to you, really has always been so important. Well, I, I've always had a lot of dear friends. Um, not, not minor friends, but very great friends, and they, they stuck with me all through the, all the, the thick and thin of the show business. And you can always pick up with them where you left off. Well, you shared a very special and happy occasion with an old friend of yours who asked you to take on a special role in her family. Hello, Harry. Do you remember 43 years ago, we asked you to be godfather to our son, Alistair? When we were looking for a godfather, we wanted someone who was a family man, who was sincere, but who would demonstrate to Alistair all the fun and happiness that's to be found in life. And you certainly did that. But Harry, thank you, because however busy you've been, you always remembered Alistair's birthday. He's going to play something for you now. He's going to play a song you know quite well. When I'm confused, Lord, show me the way. Baffled and bruised, Lord, show me the way. Still my heart. And clear my mind, prepare my soul to hear your still, small voice, your word of truth, peace, be still, your Lord is near, always so close to show you the way. Dismayed, Lord, show me the way. Lift my spirit with your love. 
bring courage, calm and peace. You who bore all for my sake, so I could walk from fear released. With you beside me, showing the way. Show me, show me the way. Wendy Craig. Mm, special friend. She wrote that. Mm, yeah. Very special. Well, you have spoken many times in the past about the unsung heroes that you yeah. meet through songs of praise, through lots of <coughs> other ways too. The people that you describe as doing good deeds with ears splitting stealth. stealth. <laughs> well, actually, we could say the same about you because over the years you've been involved in all sorts of charitable right, projects. Um, and, and well, I knew you'd be like that. And in fact, we've got lots of people here in the audience who know very well exactly how much you do to help their charities work. Um, and I knew that actually to ask you about it would be like trying to pull out your teeth without anaesthetic. So instead of that, we've invited along someone who's got a fine set of teeth and a good few stories to tell about you. Ladies oh. and gentlemen, Jimmy Tarbuck. Jimmy <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Has he taught you a thing or two over the years, cool. then, Jimmy? Sorry, say that again to Has me. Has he Pam? taught you a thing or two over he the years? He taught me so much. When I was a kid, I went into a show for eight weeks with him at the Palladium called London Laughs, and it ran for ten and a half months. <laughs> it was the most joyous time of my life going into show business and learning from such a fine, fine teacher. He taught me how to be decent, how to love your human beings, how to be kind to people, how to be humble, how to break wind when he was coming on the stage. <laughs> He'd come on as Mr. Pickwick and do those things and go, I need a nurse. <laughs> oh. And I'd burst out laughing and I'd get told off. I would get, you're making Harry laugh. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a joy, it was a joy to go to, to work. I mean, he was just a marvelous comedian. You'd be on the stage with him. And he'd say things out the side of his mouth that were quite disgraceful, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> quite disgraceful. And he'd have me in tears. <laughs> I mean, I was 24 or 5 at the time, and Harry just said to me one day, he said, you're going to be put in a very elevated position, young man. And uh, I don't know if you remember saying this in the dressing room. He said, you know, it's very nice to be big. He said, but you don't have to be very big to be nice. And I thought, dear, that's terrific, that. And through Harry, I think you have a socialistic conscience in you when you put in these positions to help people less well off than yourself. And this fella has done this time and again, and it's rubbed off on me and my family. And I don't know, the Lord's looking down there. I don't care what your faith is, but if there's going to be a sainthood, this guy should get it. He used to sing, if I rule the world. Now, I firmly believe, and no way sentimental, that if he had ruled the world, I promise you, it would have been a much, much better place. Great. Jimmy Tarbuck, thank you very much. Yo, I love you. I love you, Madly. <laughs> Get me the screens, I need a nurse. Well, we're going to hear now from someone with whom you shared a very significant day in his life. Good evening, Harry. I hope you're having a wonderful evening. My memories of you go right the way back to when I was doing my national service in Iraq. And uh, we used to listen to the goon show and found it so wonderfully funny. And then when I returned to England and uh, I was a curate in Islington, I remember seeing you on the stage when you performed in that wonderful play, Pickwick, and was entranced by your singing, the humour, uh, and everything else. And then my third memory, and you'll remember this, 
at my enthronement in Canterbury Cathedral in 1991, I invited you as a friend to come and join me in that wonderful service. We thank God for you, for your wonderful voice, your sense of humor, but perhaps all, above all, your Christian profession. You've lived out your Christian life with humor, with fun, and so unpretentiously, and we thank God for that. So enjoy your evening, and God bless you and Myra. That's a shock, isn't it? <laughs> Well, you'll have noticed, Harry, we've been joined by just a few chaps on the stage here. This is the London Welsh Male Voice I Choir. I know, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Here, especially for you to sing Onward, Christian Soldiers. Beautiful. Onward, Christian Soldiers. sound there the London Welsh male voice choir wonderful yes well of course your voice has inspired so many people over the years and through your religious broadcasting you've opened a window of faith to millions of people around the world and uh, it's coincidental of course but the patron of this choir is actually someone who's written a letter which I have in my hot little hand here it comes from his Royal Highness the Prince of Wales who says that uh, he is enormously indebted to Sir Harry Seagoon for having contributed so much over so many years to his own cultural education. And he sends you his boundless gratitude for all that you have done to enrich the lives of so many people during your long and extraordinary career. Lovely letter, isn't it? That's very mm. nice. It's a, a pretty fine way to round off the evening, but so is our next hymn, a hymn that I know that you love very much. The day thou gave us, Lord, oh, lovely. is ended. Lovely. <laughs>
Well, we have had a wonderful evening in the company of a man of great fun and faith. And, and Harry, we, all of us here at the Yvonne Arno Theatre in Guildford, feel that we would like to show our appreciation of you in the only way possible. <laughs> Sir Harry Seacombe.